St George Institute is uh, supporting such a symposium. It's only in its second year, but hopefully it'll grow and grow. And neuroprotection is almost at the heart of what we do in intensive care. <coughs> you can get all the body organs going that you like, but unless you fix the software and get people home to hopefully hug their kids and go to sporting events and things, we may be doing them a disservice. Um, we've had a wonderful introduction. Well, I'm delighted to almost speak last for a change, and hopefully uh, in this sort of science sense, because a lot of the background work's been done extremely well for me by Minoj, by Anders, um, and by Andrew in explaining neuromonitoring and the importance of neuromonitoring and neuroprotection. And maybe in one sense, the, the, the situation explained to us by Nicholas has shown us that the cardiac arrest patient is a neurologically injured patient. We might be able to return their heart, um, heartbeat and restore their circulation, but it's really about how can we best preserve neurological function. I'll just, uh, okay, so I'm Glenn. I don't have any fancy photos of animals and nor do I have a great geographic picture to show you, but I come from the Austin Hospital. There's two hospitals in Melbourne that start with A. One is the Alfred and one is the Austin. And I'm the Austin, and we're about 10 kilometres from the city centre. It's a tertiary teaching hospital, but I kind of like it as being a, in the Goldilocks zone. We're not too close to the city and we're not too far out. Um, we're not a trauma centre, but we do um, have expertise in cardiac surgery, liver failure, and renal transplant, and also um, uh, the spinal injury management. Anyway, the importance of my talk is to, say, to discuss cardiac arrest and its management in the ICU and how ventilatory management of such patients is one avenue of care that we may be able to optimise to improve neurological outcomes. So cardiac arrest in itself is a common and devastating event, both for the individual, their family, and for us as a community. Cardiac arrest in itself leads to ischemic brain injury and resuscitation leads to reperfusion injury with acute neuronal injury and neuronal damage. Our efforts in post-resuscitation care focus on two components, one being to maintain adequate oxygen delivery and modulate oxygen consumption. So one oxygen consumption modulation technique would be temperature management, and maybe one oxygen delivery technique would be carbon dioxide or ventilation management. And I hope what you take away from today's symposium in one regard is that the post-cardiac arrest patient is actually experiencing cerebral hypoperfusion and cerebral hypoxia despite the restoration of blood pressure. And this notion of cerebral hypoperfusion and cerebral hypoxia that's ongoing is supported by Doppler ultrasound, PET scans, and as we've heard a lot about, NIRS, NIRS oxygen. The patients who are resuscitated, brought to hospital, admitted to the ICU, it is not that their heart stops working after, after uh, resuscitation, it's that we can't get the brain back working. And this graph here is over 14 days and it's describing the relative contribution of shock versus neurological death in patients following cardiac arrest. And the black bars clearly demonstrate that patients die from neurological injury the longer they stay in the ICU. The current ventilation management guidelines that we have to support our practice come from ILCOR and are supported by the Australian and New Zealand um, resuscitation councils. And both guidelines suggest that at the moment, the data that we have supports targeting normal physiological range in arterial carbon dioxide. There is some literature that is examined, ventilatory management post cardiac arrest, and it's really only examined two areas. One, the role of end tidal CO2 pre-hospital, and then there's merging evidence and a growing body of evidence looking at early management of carbon dioxide after return of spontaneous circulation. When we focus on the end tidal management of carbon dioxide during CPR, a lot of the evidence that we have is drawn from observational and retrospective studies. And such studies typically show that end tidal is used to confirm end tidal end endotracheal tube placement to try to validate CPR quality itself and to help guide strategies to avoid hypocapnia. 
the evidence has shown, or when they look at the data, that during CPR, higher end tidal CO2s uh, values in patients are seen in those who achieve ROSC. However, these findings aren't consistent. So therefore, we're left with the same predicament as before, and many times in practice that further studies are needed to evaluate the benefit of guiding therapy based on end tidal CO2 values pre-hospital. Early in hospital carbon dioxide management has been investigated. From our own data here in Australia and New Zealand, we looked back at the Australia and New Zealand adult patient database, which is a repository of information of over a million uh, patients admitted. Uh, in, at this instance, it was between 2000 and 2011, had over a million patients in the registry, of which there was about 25,000 cardiac arrests. And following um, exclusions, we were able to evaluate the carbon dioxide management in 18, uh, 16,000 patients. From our data in our two countries, we found that 40% of patients experienced hypocapnia, uh, experienced normocapnia, 40% of patients had hypercapnia, and 20% were hypocapnic using the worst uh, arterial carbon dioxide on the first day. When we look at a group of patients to help identify when was the most abnormal CO2 found, we can see that within the first two to four hours, the patient's abnormal CO2 becomes corrected. So our ventilatory strategies target normocapnia pretty much from about six hours onwards. We've got patients into the normocapnic range. Using this same data set and adjusting for confounders, we were interested in knowing the outcome for patients based on their CO2 value. And we divided patients, in, patients into hypocapnia, normocapnia, and hypercapnia groups. And when we look at discharge home for survivors, we can see that those who experienced hypercapnia during the first 24 hours in the intensive care unit following cardiac arrest had a greater likelihood of being discharged home alone, discharged home than those in the hypocapnic group. <coughs> but we're not the only ones who have seen or helped to look at the impact of arterial carbon dioxide management in patients following cardiac arrest. From this group in Finland, who looked at 409 patients in 21 intensive care units in Finland, they too evaluated the impact and, and degree of arterial carbon dioxide management in the first 24 hours. And if we look at the graph on the, the right, we can see that using the proportion of mean time in the first 24 hours, the patients were often normocapnic or hypercapnic during the first 24 hours. Pleasingly, like what we saw with our discharge home for survivors, these investigators followed their patients up to 12 months, and the likelihood of a good neurological outcome was the greatest in those who experienced hypercapnia in the intensive care unit during the first 24 hours. So what this is suggesting is that, is there a therapeutic role for mild hypercapnia following return of spontaneous circulation? We're not here, and I'm not here, to advocate hypercapnia to extreme ranges, but maybe somewhere in the system there's this ability to target higher CO2 values that will benefit <coughs> patients. But why should I even be talking about carbon dioxide? Fortunately, Anders spoke about CO2 from time to time, and Minaj was great in talking about um, uh, cerebral blood flow, and again, uh, Andrew spoke about cerebral blood flow. But I would argue that arterial carbon dioxide is actually the major determinant of cerebral blood flow, and that changes in PaCO2 in the early hours after cardiac arrest may actually have a significant impact on neurological outcome. This figure here shows that the higher your CO2 is, the greater your, flow, your cerebral blood flow is, and it far outweighs the impact of oxygen or blood, um, blood, arterial blood pressure. So if we look at what's happening in the brain, what we see during episodes of hypocapnia is actually vasoconstriction of the intercerebral arterioles. And this happens with uh, hypocapnia and also occurs during hyperoxemia. Conversely, if you're in a hypercapnic state, you have dilation of your intracerebral arteries, and that's happening during hyperoxia and also hypoxia. So there could be this sweet spot where you're needing to find the right amount of CO2, but not overexposure to O2, 
because we're not talking about creating an environment that the brain is hyper oxygenated. We just need it oxygenated, but we need it perfused. So is there the cerebral vascular response to CO2 in the post-arrest brain? To help us understand this, we performed a double crossover physiological study in which we allocate our patients were um, targeted to normocapnia and then mild hypercapnia, normocapnia and mild hypercapnia <coughs> in 25 hours after cardiac arrest. In each patient and in each instance that we made them hypercapnic, the cerebral oxygen value went up. And every time we turned the respiratory rate up to make them hypocapnic or normocapnic, the cerebral oxygen value went down. So this suggested to us that the cerebral vascular response to CO2 remains active post cardiac arrest in patients that somewhat, and some may feel it doesn't. And CO2, moreover, when you have a patient that's in your unit and ventilated and sedated, arterial carbon dioxide is man manageable. You can modify this simply by manipulating the respiratory rate. Therefore, yet again, targeting mild hypercapnia may be sufficient to improve cerebral perfusion and consequently cerebral oxygenation post-arrest. To not rest on our laurels, we performed a phase two study, pilot feasibility and safety study of targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia in patients admitted to the intensive care unit following cardiac arrest. We used the standard care of normocapnia being 35 to 45, or patients were randomly allocated to mild hypercapnia being 50 to 55. This study showed many encouraging findings. One, that we were able to deliver a separation in our treatment groups, so much so that the normocapnic people spent the majority of their time in the normocapnic range, and those allocated to target the mild hypercapnia, although not reaching the target, maybe we could push a bit harder, were higher than the, than the, the standard care arm. Neuron-specific NLAs, a, bio, a brain injury biomarker that's been validated in post cardiac arrest, we saw an attenuation in those allocated to targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia. That means there was less release of neurological brain injury biomarkers in, in those in the hypercapnic group. Importantly, we found that TTMH was actually safe. We had no reports of cerebral edema, no episodes of hemodynamic instability, instability pupil dilation, or in reports of seizures in those allocated to the hypercapnic arm. And then maybe what's almost, uh, again, is important that at six months, using the global outcome score, Glasgow outcome score, we saw an improved quality of life for those allocated to targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia compared to those in the targeted normocapnic range. So what I'm here to present on behalf of a, a wonderful team is the TAME cardiac arrest trial, which is the targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia after resuscitated cardiac arrest trial. And I'm really the front man behind a lot of people and a lot of organisations that have supported this trial. And um, together with Nicholas Nielsen, we hope to harmonise them so much so that we can learn a lot in an area of need. In a little more detail, the TAME cardiac arrest trial is a phase three multicenter randomised parallel group trial. It, but figure at your site, you're either going to get into one arm or the other, and, um, but we just need many, many sites to, to explain, uh, to achieve the answer. But the hypothesis being that in resuscitated cardiac arrest patients that are admitted to the ICU, targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia compared to standard care improves neurological outcome at six months as assessed by the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended Method. Um, as Nicholas alluded, we have harmonised our inclusion criteria so much so that we too are looking at adults admitted to um, your intensive care unit following an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. ROSC is defined as stable blood pressure after 20 minutes coming to the ICU without restriction, and we too plan to in commence our um, intervention as soon as possible. These are the two arms, so targeted normocapnia or targeted therapeutic mild hypercapnia. As with the phase one trial, we're looking at um, the proportion of patients with a good, go a favorable GOES uh, at six months. We're, we need your help. Um, we have a target sample size of 1,700. 
Uh, we think it's realistic, but we think it's realistic with friends and friendship. So please either contact me or Nicholas, and Nicholas will put you in touch with me and Minaj. Um, and, and quite clearly, the Intensive Care Clinical Trials Group has done wonderful work over, over the years, and everyone at, at your sites and do wonderful work every day. But uh, the impact on the outcomes for patients following cardiac arrest over time haven't changed greatly, and so it's a desperate area of research need. It's an area that we do have great opportunity and uh, ability to harmonise internationally. We're after co-enrolment with TTM2, so it might become the, the TTM TAME study or something a bit stuttery, but uh, we'll get there. Um, but I'd just like to finish by saying thank you once again. Um, and the area of the brain and the heart and the temperature management, although we're not one single trial, I think it's important that um, we're all in, in it together. So thank you and I'm welcome to take any questions.